I have uh, the pleasure to introduce today's lecture um, speaker, Dr. David Page. And David is a well um, distinguished ach achievement professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Medical Informatics in the School of uh, Medicine and Public Health. He is also the professor in the Department of Computer Sciences at the Wisconsin Medicine. He directs the EHR project within Wisconsin Medicine's BD2K Center for Acland, uh, for uh, BD2K Center for Predictive Computational Phenotyping, the Cancer Informatics Shared Resource of the Carbon Cancer Center and is a member of the Genome Center of Wisconsin. His research is focused on algorithms on data mining and the machine learning and their applications to biomedical data. David is a recipient of NLM R01 grant and is currently on the NLM Biomedical Library and Informatics Review Committee. So let's us uh, welcome him to give a presentation on high throughput machine learning from EHR data. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Jane. Um, let me just say up front, please uh, stop me at any point if you have questions, but maybe use the microphone and, uh, and wave at me so, so I'll see you. And uh, in case we get a lot of questions and I don't make it quite to the end of the talk, I want to actually start with the acknowledgement slide and especially thank uh, NLM and, uh, and the BD2K program. And I'd like to also especially highlight uh, two graduate students, Ross Kleiman and Charles Kwong, who did a lot of the, uh, the work that I'll be talking about today. So if, you, if, if uh, my healthcare center um, back when I was in my early 30s had had an EHR, you might have seen something like the following. And uh, every time I came into the doctor, something else would, would get entered. And it would have been really useful for me if um, they could have predicted ahead of time the um, atrial fibrillation event that I had in my early 30s during, not surprisingly, my first semester as a faculty member when I was trying to build a research group and, and develop new courses and so forth. Because if they could have predicted this ahead of time, or if the EHR could have put up a little flag, I could have maybe avoided that event just with uh, an aspirin every day and, and maybe a brief uh, one-week vacation and a little bit less caffeine. Uh, this, this kind of motivation is, uh, is part of the, the goal that we have with precision medicine or personalized medicine. Now, there's some unique opportunities within cancer, for example, where you see somatic mutations that might be predictive of, of treatment response, but in general, uh, even if we're just looking at germline variants and we're looking at clinical history data, in general, a patient comes in, we have their clinical history C, some genetic information G, maybe even environmental exposures E, and we'd like to do things like uh, predict patient response to maybe three different potential treatments they could be given today for the diagnosis they receive. Uh, maybe at, for one, they're at elevated risk of an adverse drug event. Maybe for another, we can predict higher efficacy of the treatment. Also, maybe today we can predict events that they're at elevated risk for in the coming month or year, like an atrial fibrillation event, and take some preventive measures. So in order to get these sorts of predictive algorithms here that can help with treatment decisions, one, one useful way to get this is to take lots of patients where we have previous clinical and clinical history and genetic and environmental data and pipe this through leading machine learning algorithms in order to build lots of predictive models. Uh, now, Chris Longhurst and collaborators have uh, published a, a really nice paper on something they call the green button, where in addition, maybe doctors could, uh, instead of this being fed to the doctors, maybe doctors could put in requests and these learning algorithms and predictive models could be built on the fly, which would be a, a, a variation in this. But today I'm just going to talk about trying to build these sorts of models ahead of time for the kinds of things that we might like to predict. The, 
computational experiments that I'll talk about today were done in collaboration with the Marshfield Clinic, uh, which is up in the center of Wisconsin. So we have Madison down here, Marshfield here. And, uh, and Marshfield has an EHR that dates back to the early 1970s. They've expanded it over time. It, initially, it was just uh, coded diagnoses. Uh, they also have a personalized medicine research program with 20,000 individuals who have donated DNA and signed consent forms for use of the genetic data. But uh, in terms of just the EHR data, we're looking at more on the order of a million patients. And so this is the, the data that I'll be talking about today. Um, the data include from the EHR demographics, diagnosis codes. Now they've moved to ICD-10. But when we started this work 10 years ago, it was all ICD-9 with the switch happening about a year ago. Uh, we have labs, procedures, vitals. Um, and in some cases, for a small subset, we have uh, genetic information. Okay. So this is oversimplified uh, to fit on the screen. But for a typical EHR, um, we might have some basic demographic information. Um, we would have coded diagnoses. I'm not showing the codes here, but coded diagnoses and maybe text symptoms and signs and symptoms could be extracted from the text using standard encodings. Uh, we have lab results. We have prescriptions. And for a subset of the patients, we have uh, SNP genotyping, where here B is just the minor allele and A is the major allele. That's one view of the electronic health record. A very different view that's also useful for machine learning and gives you very different sorts of learning algorithms is to view each patient as a timeline. So here, A, B, and C might be different diagnosis codes. And at points in time, a patient gets an entry of A in their record or B in their record. In general, there might be thousands of these variables. And they might include not just diagnosis codes, but also drug prescriptions, maybe labs where they're associated with a number here as well as, as well as a point. Now, this type of data, either a relational database, um, and I should back up and say, when we get the data for research, it's de-identified, and it's in the form of this relational database or data warehouse. Uh, EHR systems, as you know, are, are typically optimized for fast updates and reports, and so they're typically not in a relational database. But for research, we have this format. But the typical machine learning algorithm expects the data in a single flat file or a spreadsheet. So it expects uh, one row per patient. So you can't just do a join on your big relational database and get this format of the data. You want one, one row per patient where the features are aligned. So uh, age for all the different patients line up. This becomes more of a problem when you start looking at diagnoses or labs that many patients just don't have. And so we typically would code this with things like for every lab measurement, and for various points in time, in time like uh, one year, three years, five years, ever, we would take mean, min, and max. For diagnosis codes, we might take in those same time periods counts of the diagnoses. And then we'd flag one particular field that we want to predict using all of the others. So big picture, this is what we're looking to do with machine learning, either with this kind of flattened data where we necessarily lose some information, or with the data types I showed you earlier, and with either relational learning algorithms for the relational database, or point process models like uh, piecewise constant conditional intensity models, some other kinds of models for this, this view of the data. So big picture, that's what we're after today. Let me show you a couple of concrete examples. Uh, this is some work with uh, Beth Burnside, a radiologist who came to see me about 15 years ago and was building a Bayes net to help general radiologists uh, make diagnoses from mammograms. And she said, gee, could we improve the performance with, uh, with this data that's available in the EHR or in the National Mammography Database Standard within a portion of the EHR? And then later on, could we improve this with, um, with genetic data? She already had in her model risk factors like uh, age, family history, hormone replacement therapy. But could we also use the germline SNPs? So for right now, we're not talking about somatic mutations. We're talking about the germline SNPs. Uh, if you know much about mammography, you, you'd expect to see these ROC curves much higher, like area under the ROC curve of 0.95 or 0.96. And in fact, machine learning methods can 
improve on the accuracy of a, a Bayes net like uh, Dr. Burnside's if we include a lot of data. But these are actually, in this case, the toughest patients. They're the ones who went all the way to biopsy. And so that means the, um, the radiologist said, let's, uh, let's biopsy all of these patients. And so we have ground truth here. And the point I want to bring your attention to in this particular case is that uh, actually all of these curves are doing slightly better than, I'm, than the, what I'm not showing you here, the curve for the radiologist based on their BIRAD scores. But combining SNPs from GWAS, in this case from genome-wide association studies, in this case 77 SNPs, with the mammography features and doing the machine learning gives you a significant boost in the ROC curve as shown in black. Maybe it's easier to see in the precision recall curve where now instead of over here where we want to operate in the ROC space, we want to be over here. And you can see in the range of high recall where we want to operate, there's a substantial improvement with this, uh, with this model. Another task that we looked at with Marshfield collaborators that you can imagine I was especially excited to look at was predicting atrial fibrillation. And fortunately, I converted back to a normal cardiac rhythm after about 24 hours. But for people who don't convert back, they remain at elevated risk of stroke and other types of mortality. And so here for AFF, this is in the light blue curve, which you can see here. Uh, you get an area under the curve above 0.7. We'd like to do better. But this kind of operating region here, you could see you're getting a third of the AFF cases with very few um, false positives, a low false positive rate. And if your intervention is something fairly uh, simple, like taking some aspirin or, or dropping caffeine or lowering your schedule a little bit for a while, that might, the model might already be uh, useful, a useful place to operate. What was especially interesting to us, though, and disappointing, was how hard it is to predict stroke among patients who are already in atrial fibrillation. So this kind of raised the question to us, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk in precision medicine and, and in other, other groups, there's a lot of talk about trying to build predictive models for medicine, but we don't really know how well various things can be predicted. Uh, we know now how well a few things can be predicted, and maybe uh, those of you who are uh, doing machine learning or data mining could improve on these results, but, um, but we really don't know big picture how things can be predicted. So if I were giving this talk, uh, in fact, when I was giving this kind of talk up to two years ago, I would finish with this slide. And this slide is really kind of the beginning for today's talk. The vision that we have is to build predictive models for every coded diagnosis. First of all, just so we can answer the question, how well can we do this? We're talking about doing it and, and translating these into the clinic, but we don't even know how well we can do it. Um, and in this case, we're going to just use the EHR data. It turned out for many of our applications, um, the EHR data, once you had the clinical history, the genetics, even though we could replicate the finding of findings of genome-wide association studies and get the same p-values, the genetics didn't move our AUC, our area under the ROC curve, at all. Uh, or if it did, maybe by 0 0.01, by, by a very small amount. Exceptions would be if we were looking at, um, at the breast cancer diagnosis task that I just showed you, age-related macular degeneration, or warfarin dosing. Those are the exceptions that we saw so far. So we think we can get a long way without the genetics. Um, we have the EHR data on far more patients, and so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And then the opportunity is, if some of these are really accurate already, we could sit down with the clinicians, look at these, and ask, are there interventions you could make based on these predictions and maybe translate some of these to the clinic right away? So just some details on how we're going to accomplish this. Uh, we started with 1.5 million patients, but some of these are, are patients like, uh, like me who, who uh, went, uh, went from Madison up to Manaqua for the weekend and, and went skiing and, or snowmobiling and broke a leg or whatever. And so Marshfield provides health care for much of the upper half of the state. And so you get people uh, who are just uh, interacting with the health care system very infrequently. So to, to have any hope of making a prediction, 
um, we need at least one encounter before that the prediction could be based on and one encounter, another encounter later that you could try to predict. And so we limited ourselves to, to a subset of the patients, uh, still over, over a million. Now, when we did atrial fibrillation and when we did breast cancer, when we looked at predicting myocardial infarction or myocardial infarction among patients who were on Vioxx at the time, we looked at some of these tasks. We spent a lot of time, um, just like the Emerge group and others, and in fact, uh, our Marshfield collaborators are very involved with Emerge, we spent a lot of time phenotyping, getting a really careful definition so we had the right cases and controls in machine learning lingo, the right positive and negative examples of the event, and we knew when the event happened. Now if we want to automate the whole process, we need uh, an automatic way to do this across diagnoses. So initially, the, well, the way I'll talk about today is we use the rule of two. You could use, it's common to use rule of k with k equals two or three or four. Uh, otherwise, you might get a code of 410 for an MI where the clinician just needs to bill for a troponin test and see if the patient had an MI. And, uh, and they never go back in and take that code back out. That's, uh, you know, that's not the purpose of the EHR. And so you'd get a lot of false positive examples for MI. So we use rule of two. Uh, Peggy Peisig at Marshfield, who did her PhD with me in Madison, actually recently did a phenotyping by machine learning study where she used initially this kind of positive example just to train the machine learning algorithm not to predict who will have an MI in the future, but who did have one. Uh, that turns, to be, it turns out to be remarkably challenging. Uh, Vanderbilt, Josh Denny and colleagues have also done some related work using machine learning just for phenotyping or saying who did have an event. Uh, and so you could plug that kind of method in here. But for today, we're using rule of two, and we'll be using the machine learning for, if you will, predictive phenotyping or predicting the event in the future. Okay. We also wanted to automate the matching of cases and controls. So cases required at least two entries of the code um, to avoid noisy data to some extent. We required controls to have no entries of the code. And then another challenge is if we wanted to predict the event ahead of time, we started out years ago saying, let's just take data up to the day before the event. But it turns out you get things like the result of a troponin test entered before sometimes the MI code of 410 gets entered that, uh, that says, yeah, based on the test, they really had an MI. So we pushed that back uh, to 30 days in advance. And more recently, the director of our uh, Clinical and Translational Sciences Award, Mark Dresner, pushed on us to see how far we could predict even farther in the future, and I'll be talking about those results. But in this picture, we're, um, we're cutting off the data 30 days before. We're saying, we, you just get to use the data back here in order to predict, is this patient positive or negative for the diagnosis? Will they get the diagnosis? Um, because controls are age and gender matched with cases, uh, we go ahead and censor, censor or cut off the, date, the data at the same date for the matching control as for the patient. If you don't do this, uh, you, right, you could argue you could use all this data for the controls, but if your controls systematically have more data or data for a longer time than your cases, then you end up with things like drugs that get introduced out here in this part of the data, uh, say, after this date, that end up being really predictive. If you're on that drug, you don't have the event, and it's just by confounding and not because the drug has any causal effect. So those are some of the issues that we deal with. Another issue that we had to deal with is we wanted an automated approach to define the cases and pick the controls. But we noticed when we did this that some things really surprised, some diagnoses really surprised us for being incredibly easily predicted. We saw complications arising from pregnancy being really accurately predicted. And if you think about it for a while, you can come up with the reason that our controls are just age and gender match. They're not necessarily pregnant. So being pregnant is a great predictor. 
uh, compared to general controls of, uh, of pregnancies arising for complications. We could have fixed that one issue with a special purpose fix, but then it applies to things like complications arising as a result of a procedure or codes for complications arising from diabetes or specific kinds of issues related to, to diabetes. And so we needed a general fix. Um, it turns out even for something like complications arising from pregnancy, and there are a number of these codes, that not everybody who has that actually has the code for pregnancy in their record. And so we didn't use 100% here, but we said if at least 85% of the case patients have this code, then, uh, then we're going to control for that as well. Uh, And some of the prior work that we had done, uh, that I showed, you know, I showed you atrial fibrillation and, uh, and breast cancer, in some of that work we had used relational learning or other kinds of uh, machine learning algorithms that we and others do research on that we're really excited about and, and we want to we run those. But a big question we always ask ourselves is, is there an existing machine learning algorithm that would really do just as well? And random forest, uh, perform to a machine learning researcher uh, frustratingly well <laughs> in practice. And so um, we decided to turn that frustration into a positive and say, random forests are pretty fast because decision tree learners are really fast. And um, they're a little slower, the random forests are slower than decision tree learners because you're learning many trees. And although the, although the defaults in most existing code uh, have you learning 10 or 20 trees, we see with lots and lots of features, you get, we're talking thousands of features that we get uh, from the EHR, um, you really do better learning on the order of one or 2,000 trees. So we're learning lots of trees. This takes longer, but still pretty quick. And so we use random forest for this task. And so we set up, whoops, set up a training set for um, every ICD-9 code where we have enough data. And the method can be applied equally easily to ICD-10 codes, but we started this work uh, two years ago before ICD-10 codes were available. We build random forests for each of these tasks and evaluate the models by area under the ROC curve. So earlier, I showed you ROC curves for individual models. Now I'm going to show you a plot of areas under the ROC curve across 4,000 different codes. So this is from 4,000 different models. Uh, this is for predicting 30 days in advance, a month in advance, as I showed you earlier. And we were pretty surprised that the mean AUC was slightly above 0.8. And so and you've got a lot of things uh, you know, above 0.9 we're predicting here. Even if you push this out half a year in advance, you're still up close to that 0.8 as the mean. And then, as I told you, Mark Dresner pushed on us and said, what if you try to predict 10, 15, 20 years in advance? Well, as you would expect, so this was our 30 days, this was our six months, uh, this is going on back to, to two years, five years, this, this is 20 years in the future. You're, you're back where you, we thought you'd be, around 0.5, just a little better. But even so, quite surprisingly, you can't see it very well here, but for 15 and 20 years, there are um, about a dozen codes where you climb up above 0.7. They're all either related to disorders of the eye or neurological disorders. And I should clarify, we're always predicting first occurrence of the event. You could be more accurate if you're predicting second or third or later occurrences, occurrences of the events because uh, prior occurrences of the event may be predictive of future occurrences. It's always first occurrence. So we were surprised that, uh, that several things can be predicted even 15, 20 years in advance. Now, not every one of these gives you the opportunity to take action or to intervene, but uh, even if some of them do, uh, this is a potential for translation into the clinic. Okay. Another question we wanted to ask, though, is this was just on equal numbers of cases and controls. And since we had a lot of data, let me back up and say, I'm not showing you error bars here because if I showed you 95% confidence intervals on these histograms, they barely shift at all. But uh, we asked ourselves, whoops, what if, we, um, what if we carried out a perspective trial? This is something we'd like to do in the future, but we said, you know, really we could do it in the past. We could take data up through 2012 to train our models, data up through 2013 to feed in about patients, and data up 
through 2013 to 2014 to test the patients. And so we can say, if we built all the models back here uh, and used additional follow-up data on patients here, and we made the prediction right here, how many of these predictions would have been true in the coming year? We use the six-month ahead-of-time model, but you could use some combination of the models. And if we do that, in fact, uh, even in this kind of simulated, it's real data, but it's a simulated prospective study because we're backing up a couple of years to do it. Uh, this is your histogram of AUC values. Now we have fewer patients for any one event, so it is informative to do the 95% confidence intervals. The red is your upper, the green is your lower. 95% uh, confidence interval on the same, um, the same histogram of AUCs. I should stop a minute and ask if anybody has any questions so far. Yes. If you ask a question, uh, you know, a trivial one. Are you computing the AUC on the set on which you established the model? Oh, or are you I need to clarify or, that. Great question. Great question. No, this is all... This is all cross-validated. Well, what I just showed you now is testing on, a, on uh, the future set of patients. So, yeah. So for this evaluation, we held aside 10,000 patients to test prospectively. I'm glad I stopped. That's a great question. We held aside 10,000 patients to test prospectively. We did not use them at all in building our training models. The case control stuff that I told you about earlier and showed you earlier, that was all by tenfold cross-validation. So in every case, it's a held-out test set. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. I'm a physician. I'll give you that context when I begin. Uh, so a real question, maybe you want to look at this at the end, uh, is... I'm very impressed with your predictive ability. Uh, what I would really want to know as a study is what is your marginal gain of prediction over that of uh, a clinician who knows the patient? Yeah, great, great question. And, uh, and in fact, we are in the process now. Uh, you could imagine it's, it's tough to get a lot of clinician time to do this evaluation. So what we're doing now is using some of the Framingham models as, a, a, as surrogates for that and trying to measure. And I don't have those results for you today, but it's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions? These are fantastic. OK. So these are the results so far. And we're very excited about these results. But I want to take time to tell you about some of the issues and, and next steps that we want to look at. And I think I've lowered this mic through hitting it repeatedly already, but move it here. Um, some, these are some of the biggest issues that we've encountered so far. Uh, one is we're machine learning researchers, so we just like to know uh, our random forests our best choice of algorithms. And in, in a lot of our one-off experiments that we did for various diagnoses, we observed that random forests and linear SVMs tended to work the best of all methods on the flat file representation. For some cases, we can get a little, we can get some marginal gains, but significant with the relational learning approach or other approaches. But most of the time, random forests are the best, linear SVMs are next. But uh, it'd be nice to, we just tested those uh, individually on a few tasks, and it'd be nice to test those uh, across all of, these, uh, all of these tasks. Can we do better phenotyping than rule of two? We think we can, and Peggy Pysig's approach is automatable. It just will slow our runtime down some, but we want to plug that in. A big challenge we've encountered in practice is back when we were doing one model at a time, the clinicians loved looking at a set of rules or a decision tree, and they really gave great feedback. Looking at a random forest with 1,000 trees becomes a little more of a challenge, and looking at 4,000 of those models uh, becomes a huge challenge. And so you know, we, we're calling this approach high-throughput machine learning, where we're learning lots of these models, but how do we do high throughput evaluation of these models? And that's a, a giant challenge for us. Um, a big barrier to doing this in practice wide, in a widespread way is privacy. So we'd love to test these models at other healthcare centers. And we're probably going to do some of that in the next few years. But a big barrier we encounter is privacy. And the easiest way to overcome it is to send the models. You do have some concern. Uh, is this big random forest model going to leak any information about your de-identified patients? I think that's not a, a huge concern, but it's certainly one we have to think about. Uh, but the bigger concern is uh, getting a healthcare system either 
to give you their de-identified data, uh, which is data that's a valuable resource for them and they have legal concerns over privacy for their patients, or getting that same healthcare center, if they're not willing to give you their data, to assign someone's time to running and evaluating all these models on their, on their data, and both are, both are barriers. We've, uh, we and others have done research on approaches like differential, differential privacy uh, and fully homomorphic encryption to try to empower some of these. The encryption-based approaches have a big problem with runtime, and, uh, and the fully homomorphic encryption approaches are still not to a place where, where that's feasible. The differential privacy approaches uh, we've seen, and we published a paper on this related to warfarin dosing, but uh, by the time you ramp up the privacy levels enough to really protect privacy, uh, you're adding so much noise that you're tanking the AUCs of your model. You're, you're really lowering those AUCs. I think the story would change if we had something on the order of uh, 100 million patients, or even better, on the, on the order of all the patients in the country or a big chunk of the patients in the world, but when we're looking at the patients for 20 healthcare systems, say, uh, as we did in the warfarin study, and you're just getting a subset of those patients, those who are on warfarin, um, you don't have enough data to overcome the noise that differential privacy adds. We like to incorporate genomics, but there's still challenges with getting this on the same large number of patients. But the issue that I want to spend the rest of the time that we have today on is this one, which is, as we discussed with the clinicians, translating some of these models into the clinic, we first talk about the predictive accuracies of the models, because that's critical. Uh, but the question that immediately follows as we actually look at the models themselves relates to causation. And so many of the features used in the models, you, you're naturally tempted to interpret them as causal. So if this drug uh, causes you to go down a branch in the decision tree where more people get this event, you wonder, is the drug causing the event? But it may not be. It may be the result of confounding. And so if you're going to be making treatment decisions, you don't necessarily want to make these based on these models because they're predictive, but they're not known to be causally faithful. And by causally faithful, I just mean now if I go in and adjust something, like I give this patient a different drug, that changes where the decision trees take me in the forest and the prediction I get but I no longer have the same guarantee of that accuracy. I evaluated by cross-validation the predictive accuracy, and I know it's a good estimate of future accuracy of this model, but all bets are off now once I start making changes. And so we really want causally faithful models. And so I want to take a minute to give a way too brief review of past work in causal inference, if you're from the biostatistics side, or causal discovery, if you're from the computer science, artificial intelligence side of things, and talk about some attempts to try to make models more causally faithful or to try to get insight from these predictive models that are predictive ac predictively accurate, uh, get insight into causation and have the results be causally accurate. So that's the goal now. And let me stop again and see if anybody has questions, big picture, about about any of these issues. Okay. So if you imagine a spectrum, which I'm sorry I don't have it labeled, but over here on the right I'm going to have, I know everything about the world, or everything that's relevant, except whether there's a causal link between two variables. Does drug X increase the risk of condition Y, or decrease the risk of condition Y? And over here, I know almost nothing. Uh, maybe I just, I want to know, does drug X increase the risk of condition Y? But I don't know um, anything else that's relevant. And so it turns out there's been work at these extremes. If the entire causal network is known, except this one edge we want to infer, uh, work by Judea Pearl is very relevant here within the context of Bayesian networks. Work by Jamie Robbins at Harvard is very relevant here. At the other end, if I just know about cause and effect, there was an approach called self-controlled case series uh, that was developed originally, I think, motivated by asking the question in the UK, uh, was a new, I think it was measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine increasing the risk of a particular event that I don't remember at, the, at this point. 
In fact, it showed there was a, ri a risk, an elevated risk. But self-controlled case series um, are an approach to using patients as their own controls so you can avoid the kind of confounding I talked about by other variables, even when you don't know what those other variables are. So over here, we avoid confounding by knowing everything else that's going on and confounding, if you're familiar with deseparation in Bayes' nets, confounding essentially can be inferred by reasoning about deseparation. Over here, you assume you don't know anything else that's relevant, but if you use a patient as his or her own control, as both the positive example while they're on the drug or during exposure period and the negative example while they're not, then you adjust for all the other factors of the patient because they're their own control. Uh, the only kind of confounders you can get are the time-varying confounders, which, which is a risk we'll talk about more. Uh, but there's lots of room in the middle here for more work. There's great work that's coming out, for example, out of the Pittsburgh BD2K Center on Causal Modeling that's in conjunction with uh, the CMU group. It's done a lot of great work on, on uh, graphical model approaches to causal modeling. Uh, and of course, we can put, we can fit in here, of course, the foundational work by Donald Rubin on, uh, that's led to much uh, exciting follow-up work and propensity models and those kinds of approaches. But I want to actually move this over a little further and zero in here and actually say there's more room over here where we just know the cause and possible cause and not the effect. So a drug has just come on the market. We don't know what it might be causing, but we want to reason about all the things it could be causing. Or some, an event is occurring, and we don't know what's causing it, but we want to reason about that. So there's been work by um, David Madigan, and Mark Suchard, and others extending SCCS to kind of handle these approaches. Uh, there have been approaches in here like uh, differential prediction that's used a lot in the marketing community and looking for bias in standardized tests. Uh, so that's just an incomplete but a big picture overview of this area of causal inference or causal discovery. And we'd like to use some of these findings with our predictive approach that I already told you about so that we can not just do accurate prediction but gain some insights. Okay, so a quick one slide review of self-controlled case series. Here's drug one in orange, drug two in yellow. For drug one, if we want to know, is it increasing risk of MI? This is one patient, but we'll look at many patients. We're comparing how many MIs occur during exposure periods versus unexposed periods. So it's looking here like the orange drug may have some causal effect, but the yellow uh, doesn't or could even be protective. Okay. Now... Jamie Thompson came to us uh, about a year ago, well, a little over a year ago now, uh, interested in EHR data for doing um, what's very much like adverse drug event discovery, which we were already working on, but looking for, um, I, guess he, I guess maybe Jamie's an optimist, looking for good side effects of drugs that nobody recognizes rather than bad side effects. And so the first thing we did, he said, let's look at blood glucose, blood pressure, LDL cholesterol. And the first thing we did was to take the simplest approach you could imagine and for every drug, look at every patient where we had measures of the lab test in question before and after the drug and look at the average change before and after the drug within tight windows to avoid the time varying confounding uh, as patients age and so forth. And... Uh, and it turned out, for blood glucose, that turned up some drugs that we know, lower glucose. It turned up things like insulin and metformin. It also turned up a lot of things we know elevate glucose, uh, like glucose. <laughs> Taking glucose, you know, you'll get a prescription for glucose. We get glucose without a prescription. You get a prescription for glucose when you get insulin in case you get too much insulin. And so confounding was a big problem. So we said, okay, we know how to deal with confounding with self-controlled case series, but the problem is self-controlled case series, just look at binary uh, conditions. Does the patient have the event or not? So my student, Charles Kwong, said, okay, let's take this data where these spikes here are fasting blood glucose measurements, but they could be any numeric response, any continuous response, like blood pressure or LDL cholesterol levels. Uh, maybe other diagnoses we get are relevant. We're going to, key it, going to key in on the drugs and drug exposure eras 
So drug exposure errors, if you're familiar with the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, for example, it's one thing they did a lot of research into, and, and I was involved some with that group, so we were making use of their ideas about computing exposure errors. But the problem we ran into is that with these numeric responses, SCCS doesn't address those. And time-varying confounding can be a real big issue. Even simpler than that, a big issue is different patients have different baseline blood glucose levels. If they're not getting any drugs at all, and if you're taking fasting blood glucose, different patients have different baselines. Uh, could we you do the same trick that SCCS did with Poisson regression? Could we do that now with a kind of linear regression to get that uh, baseline? And so we saw we could do that with a kind of fixed effect uh, effect model, but we know that most of our measurements get worse with age. Uh, typically, we're looking at blood glucose and cholesterol and things like that. They go up with age. There's not a constant baseline. So Charles said, is there a way that we could extend this real-valued response, SCCS, to handle a time-varying baseline? And I have to apologize at this point. There are two slides that didn't transfer over well from my Mac to the PC here, and they don't display right. So I'm just going to have to talk you through what this would say if it were displaying right. We didn't have time to fix it. Uh, the gist of what we're doing here is setting up something that if you're a machine learning researcher, looks much like a fused lasso penalty. But we're basically saying we want to use drugs, all the drugs the patient is on, give each drug a coefficient, use that to build a linear model to predict fasting blood glucose levels for this patient, but we're going to predict each model in part by the drugs the patient's on and in part by a guess of that patient's baseline. But we'd like to let the guesses of the patient's baseline go up over time. Okay? The problem is if we do that generally, you're just going to assign all the blame for an increasing level here to the baseline changing. So you want to penalize too big of a baseline change. So what this would say if the fonts were coming up right, is it would say if two, con these should be T's, these boxes, and if two consecutive measurements of baseline, uh, T sub J plus one and T, or, uh, patient I time J plus one, patient I time J times J, if the difference in those times is less than some amount, say six months, then um, you get penalized when there's a big difference in the measurement values. Okay, so this I now, this, this is a, a big difference in these measurement values. So this is some extra notation here that says if the times are not too far apart, then the measurement values, the baseline values should not be too far apart. You assign part of the blame for the increase, increasing trend to the baseline changing, the rest of it to drugs. And if there's any drug that across many patients seems to be predictive of an increased value, then, um, then you get this prediction that we're talking about. So let me use this pointer so I don't have to keep turning around. Does that show? Yeah, that shows up. I'm going I'm to use the mouse as a pointer instead. I should have thought of that earlier. Uh, let me take time to talk through these two graphs and to talk through what you're seeing here. So Charles actually did uh, the C... SCCS was a continuous version of SCCS that he first put together without the baseline. So the contribution here was just to take SCCS, which was for binary responses, apply it to lab measurements or to numeric responses. Uh, and this is a variation on that in yellow that we won't get into the details, but it worked better. Uh, the blue and the red are the corresponding baseline regret regularization methods that correspond to these. So the blue is the version that had that baseline uh, approach I just showed you, uh, the version of the green that included the baseline, the orange is the version of the yellow that includes the baseline, and this is showing you your precision. So when you predict a drug is going to lower blood glucose, what fraction of those drugs are in fact known to lower blood glucose? Um, now your precision may not be perfect in part uh, because some drugs may be unknown, they're potential rediscoveries. Um, and so this is saying if you return eight, just your top eight drugs, so it's kind of like Google returning your first page of hits and you want those to all be relevant, uh, all these approaches work fine. 
but as you return more on the order of 32 or 40 of your top drugs, uh, now we start to see precision dropping, but we see the baseline methods um, consistently performing well. Instead of precision at K, if we look at your, um, if we look at precision as it varies with, with changing our false positive rate threshold, so saying this is kind of another way in addition to the top K, saying we're willing to put up with a higher false positive rate in order to, um, or a lower false positive rate in this case in order to increase our precision, we see again that the baseline approach consistently helps. But the point is probably more easily seen with these results. So when, when we did the first kind of straightforward thing that, that I told you about when Jamie Thompson first contacted us, half the stuff was green and half was red, with a little, a little white thrown in. So the greens are drugs known to lower glucose, the reds are drugs known to elevate glucose, the whites are unknown, so potential um, drug repurposing targets or drugs that might be used to lower blood glucose possibly with further research. Um, without the baseline, you're still getting reds here. With the baseline regularization, in fact, you get this result over here on the left. So we feel like this version, this extension of SCCS to a numeric response has some real value for causal discovery. Um, besides just drug repurposing, though, I want to go back to the idea of binary response and this OMOP task that I mentioned, Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership. They put a task together with, uh, uh, this isn't exactly their task, but I'm just illustrating the idea of what their task was trying to do, with 10 drugs of, of interest, 10 health outcomes of interest, with the goal being just to match them up as shown, as shown here. Okay, so these are some more details um, about their task. And so Charles extended his baseline regularization idea that he did for continuous response. He found a way to extend it to your risk for a binary, um, for bi a particular binary response like a disease. And he found that it could be used to make SCCS more robust to time varying confounding. So if confounding is not time varying, SCCS is already carefully designed to handle that. But he found it could handle time. This is the other slide that didn't transfer well. I apologize it's so, so fuzzy. But I won't get into the details of Charles's method, but it's the same baseline regularization approach. SCCS was run on the OMOP task across many different parameter settings. And, uh, and you see the results here in this kind of blue or aqua. Uh, these are AUCs. Uh, and um, and so we're we're plotting. Basically, you want to be farther over to the right here. And so, with baseline regularization, it helped almost always. But there was a little pocket where it actually hurt. And you can see that over here that there was a little subset of tasks where it hurt, and the set of parameter settings where this actually hurt. So these were all with the same drug set, but with different parameter settings for the algorithms and things like how you compute a drug exposure window and how you compute does risk persist after the drug exposure window ends. So there's a big question of, on adverse drug events, does, does, do you stay at an elevated risk? Um, for example, with Vioxx and the MI risk, does it stay elevated or is it just elevated during the exposure window? And what he found is, is not too surprising that baseline regularization consistently helped except in the case where we said the risk persists forever after. And then you could imagine that there's not much baseline risk to regularize. It just, uh, it just stays level after this point. But in every other case, of, in every other combination of settings, this approach helped. So I just have one more point that I want to, to make here. And we've got about 10 minutes. So I'll try to wrap up in five minutes and leave five minutes for questions. A limitation for adverse drug events for all of the methods that, that OMOP tested and the evaluation itself, even though I was a big fan of, of OMOP and then the ongoing initiatives like um, Odyssey and IMEDS, um, even though I was a big fan of what OMOP was doing, the limitation is it assumed that we knew the potential adverse events ahead of time and the potential set of drugs we were looking at, but an adverse event could, uh, could be something that doesn't even neatly correspond to a particular diagnosis code that's in our EHR. 
And it may be some constellation of labs and procedures that we need in order to characterize that event. This also doesn't take into account context. It's just looking at uh, global risk of this drug for this event. And it may be that you only see the elevated risk in a small set of susceptible patients, susceptible by their genotype or susceptible by the other drugs that they're on or, or other types of, uh, of interactions of other variables with, with the drug. What we'd really like is to have this list of drugs over here and not have a predefined list of conditions, but to have the whole EHR or EMR here, and then let the learning algorithm find, uh, for example, for COX-2 inhibitors, that patients P on a particular drug D that's a COX-2 inhibitor. We already know they're on COX-2 inhibitors, but let's see if anything that happens to them, to these patients consistently, or more often than we'd expect by chance, after they start the drug, uh, is there anything like that? Because it may be a predictor uh, or it may be a characterization of an adverse drug event. So in fact, if we run rule learning on this task, the rule that we get says a patient P is on uh, this drug D. If patient P is experiencing hypertension, the patient is older, and the drug D in particular is not just any COX-2 inhibitor, it's Vioxx. And in fact, when we go back to the literature, we see evidence for exactly this rule. So it wasn't just MI, but Vioxx appeared to cause uh, some other increasing risk. And we found this without predefining the rule. Now, truth in advertising, the problem that we have is, um, well, let me back up first and say briefly, you know, we already know who's on a COX-2 inhibitor, but the trick we're taking is to use that as our supervision our, our feature we're trying to predict, even though we don't need to predict it, we know it, but ask, are there features after they start the COX-2 inhibitor that seem to be associated with their being on this drug? That's more common. Are there events more common to patients on this drug than patients not? Just looking at data after they started the drug. Okay? So we call this approach reverse machine learning just because we're reversing the causation. We're trying to predict who was on a COX-2 inhibitor. You know, you, it, we'd really like to predict who's going to have this adverse event, but we don't want to assume we know the adverse event ahead of time. So we're predicting in the reverse causal direction, but it still lets us, um, lets us find potential subgroups at risk of per particular types of events. We're using a particular type of relational learning here to find these subgroups. And the truth in advertising piece is that, yeah, we find things like MI and the rule I just showed you, but we also find a lot of stuff that appears to still be the result of confounding. So we've been trying to take our earlier lessons about SCCS and build an SCCS-like scoring function. So this is saying probability that the patient, if the patient was on both the drug and had the if the patient both was on the drug and had the condition, what's the probability the condition came later than the drug? Okay? And you could also normalize this by how, how this condition matches up with lots of drugs or this drug matches up with lots of conditions. And so taking that approach, we're basically comparing patients after they start a drug versus before. And you could score with several different functions, but we're just looking at uh, how many cases do we pick up on who, have this, who satisfy this rule after they have the drug versus the same people before they start the drug. And you find MI, but you also find a lot of stuff that looks like it's the result of confounding. Now with the uh, FDA, Office of Generic Drugs, we're looking at the same kind of topic and asking, is there evidence that a generic drug uh, when everybody was switched on to it, when it came on the market, is there evidence it's causing something that the brand name drug didn't cause? We're using gabapentin here as what's sometimes called a negative control. We don't think we should be able to find anything in this case. We're doing the same trick patients uh, after they start, after they switch to generic versus back when they were on the brand. And, um, and let me just jump ahead a little bit over some of these details and say we clearly get a lot of um, confounders popping up. For example, everyone was switched to 
brand or to generic gabapentin when it became available in 2005, at least in, in Marshfield, just about everyone was switched. And so you get other things popping up as predictive of generic gabapentin that are clearly confounders. It's just that 2005 also happened to be when Marshfield went to electronic uh, prescribing of drugs. So we're finding ways to adjust for these types of confounding, which is an active research area, but we're still, we can get rid of these, but we're still having findings now that we wonder, are they also the result of confounding? But big picture, the goal of what I've been talking about in the second half of the talk is just developing techniques we could combine with our standard machine learning for prediction in order to get more causal insight. And if I go back to the green button idea that I mentioned from uh, Longhor Longhurst, Harrington, and, uh, and Shaw, their idea was when you find something interesting in the EHR, uh, maybe there's an opportunity to, to start up a clinical trial, kind of have an EHR-driven clinical trials. I think it's a brilliant idea, but if you were to do that, well, that was just one part of their, of their paper. If you were to do that, you'd still want to do everything in your power to test out this potential uh, link, causal link, before you fire up a clinical trial. And so I think this is continually going to be a big area of research. Causal discovery is already a big area of research within machine learning and causal inference within biostatistics. I think it's going to become especially more and more important as we do high throughput machine learning from electronic health records. So I want to argue today that, um, that we can, in fact, automate these prediction tasks. And, and why stop at diagnoses? Why not predict who's likely to get a certain procedure in the future or go on a certain drug in the future. Uh, we need to continue to improve the accuracy, but translating models to the clinic requires a lot more than that. It requires comprehensibility, and in many cases, I think it's going to require getting models that are more causally faithful. And with that, I'll stop and take a couple more questions. Thank you. Any questions, or did you get them all in earlier? Yeah. Yeah. I have a question which is related to the previous question about the marginal advantage. Now, I'm not an MD, so I may say something wrong, but I tried to give you an example. So when you are young, you have high tension. That's not normal. So probably when you're, you'll be old, you'll be, have a condition. Now, you will probably be given some drugs because the doctor has the idea that you may develop this condition. Now, in your system, I would have no condition, take the drug, and develop the condition. So I would find that that drug is giving me the condition, right. which is probably wrong. Yeah, so, that's, so that's, a great, that's a great example of the kind of confounding that we're worried about. And so let me first say, just right off the bat, I'm not claiming, no matter how much algorithm development we do, I'm not claiming we can completely solve all the confounding problems from observational data. And eventually, you'll have to do a randomized controlled trial to find something like this. I'm just arguing we should do everything in our power to make all the discoveries we can from the observational data before we start testing in patients. And so in your case, and we could set up several other cases like this, if... Um, if there's a drug that consistently across many patients just happens to get started the same time uh, some nonlinear change happens to their, uh, some big change happens to their baseline, then, then it's a lost cause for us. And that's kind of what happened in the gabapentin case, that, uh, that everybody was switched in 2005 from brand to generic, and Marshfield switched to electronic prescribing in 2005. And when those things happen, uh, Unless we get a lot of background knowledge and interview people and so forth, we, we have no hope of finding them with our methods. But we're trying to do everything in our power uh, to, to make these algorithms more robust against more types of confounding uh, before we take a potential finding to an RCT, a randomized controlled trial. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you're, you're certainly right that, that there's confounding we can't get around. Yes? Yeah, uh, so it seems that for this kind of machine learning based approach to work, you need a lot of uh, data about the patients, right? So uh, my question is regarding when you do not have enough data, like uh, say you said around millions of patient records, right? 
so in that case can we um, do some kind of hybrid uh, information so some information coming from the ehr data yes. and the observations and also some information coming from the published literature like uh, the doctors have or other uh, professionals have already done some experiments and they have given some kind of information if this is the uh, symptom and uh, this creates this kind of disease so can we uh, merge these two type of information and make it as a hybrid system what is your yeah. thought about this yeah great question so if i understood correctly you're saying uh, we might not have enough data and so two things can how how can we know when we have enough data and then how can we bring in more information to be more accurate and in terms of knowing when we have enough data you know, I typically do that empirically and with with a learning curve and machine learning will often do learning curves to ask are we on the steep part of the curve where we really need more data or have we have we flattened out you're plotting uh, accuracy on the y-axis against the amount of data on the x-axis and that's certainly a big argument for getting over the privacy barriers and combining data across the country from many sources. Um, bringing in other types of information is a huge opportunity. For example, in adverse drug events, we could also get information from um, social media. Are people reporting issues? Or uh, there, there are potentially other types of data that we could bring in. And of course, human expertise is, uh, is a great help. So I think, um, I think you're exactly right that these are ways to try to, to perform better when we're in the limited data range, but uh, I don't have any specific ideas on how to bring that information in, but I think it's, it's the right approach. So I think we're two minutes over, but should I, can I take another question or should I? Okay, so I'll just, I'll take your question down here. I'll, okay, or, or we can take it down. Okay, then. Um, I, so I noticed that you uh, are director of the Carbone Cancer Center as well, and I wondered um, what kind of work you've done in combination with oncology uh, and electronic health records. So, for example, have you done, tried to combine genomic information, uh, you know, genetic testing before uh, drug selection and outcomes, or, or are you thinking of that? We, yeah, we are very Which brings up the, the um, sample size question that was just asked before. <laughs> um, well, maybe I can push my luck and ask you another question um, just about the, uh, the, the privacy barriers that you've been alluding to. I just, I just wonder how much of it is the privacy per se and the need to protect that and how much it is that, that hospital systems regard the uh, patient data that they have as a kind of an ATM. I think it's mostly the second one. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're more concerned than the patients are. Yeah. And uh, I think part of that is legitimate because if a patient all of a sudden gets very concerned, it's yeah. shared. Can't that's go back. A legal issue, but, yeah. but I think a lot of it is they, they, that's a valuable resource. For yes. Them. And I think they need to see that they can get more value by sharing. By sharing. Or we need to yeah. build technologies where a, group of, a number of groups can come together and without actually seeing each other's data can collaborate to build models. Mm -hmm. That's, that's exactly what we face at NCBI, is trying to build a case for sharing. <laughs> yeah. 